Welcome everyone, thanks so much for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to let you know that this is the only San Francisco Blockchain Week event in the Valley <laughs> for the whole week. So um, yay for the Valley. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm pleased to, um, to introduce you to Jay Yang. Jay's been an incredible support, particularly last year. Um, we did about three Ask Me Anything blockchain events and uh, he um, was a fantastic educator in that. So, um, did you want to say a few words, Erin? Um, so Erin actually uh, organised the venue tonight and we really appreciate everything she's done. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erin Moeller. Um, I support the Office of the CTO in TIPCO Labs. Um, and TIPCO Labs, it's a program uh, that our customers and partners can gain insight into TIPCO's innovation activities in areas um, such as blockchain, AI, ML, and IoT. I just wanted to let everyone know the end of March, we are having a blockchain and IoT hackathon here. So I hope you guys all look and uh, register and come join us. So welcome. Thanks again, Erin. And um, now I'm going to pass it over to Jay and Jay's going to uh, do the presentation. Thanks. Okay, um, so this is a um, presentation where I need um, <clears throat> audience participation. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. Um, you know, there's only 18 slides, so I'll go through it relatively quickly. There are some parts where I do go into kind of weeds, uh, and, you know, dig deep into what the flows are. So, welcome. Um, so everybody's probably asking, okay, what is this about? Bridging the chains. Okay, how can you bridge the chains when there's nothing to bridge right now? So, <laughs> well, <laughs> sad, uh, sadly, um, so I'm from Tassin, uh, and we're creating a non-custodial uh, exchange where the control goes back to the traders. So we don't take custody of your money. We don't need to know who you are. We have uh, we have very high standard in keeping your private data private uh, because number one, we don't keep your private data. Therefore, there you go. So if you're interested, please talk to me after the venue. And again, I want to thank you, thank you for um, joining me, and I want to thank uh, Tipco for hosting this event. And thanks, uh, thank you very much, Pimo, for organizing this fantastic event. So, blockchains are sort of islands of uh, <coughs> states or diffs. So if you're talking about UTXO and Bitcoin, there are different diffs from previous. Uh, uh, payment states, and then you know Ethereum actually has a state somewhere. So, but the problem is all of those are on their own. They're not uh, sharing data, and it's very difficult to uh, bridge that gap. And uh, we, there's a good reason for it, right? So, <coughs> blockchains are all internally consistent, and because they're internally consistent, they're, they make no assumption of, of some assumptions about other chains following their rule, and that wasn't the you know that wasn't the reason why all these. Uh, blockchain projects have been developed in the first place. They want to be internally consistent so that whatever people are doing with it are all followed through. Um, and, but then the problem is now, you know, <clears throat> once you have people starting to use, it, use those blockchain applications, sometimes you want to trade, sometimes you want to use it as a signal for doing other things, so interoperability becomes an issue. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Now, so there are some categories of cross-chain operations. So one is a swap. So let's say I want to trade, you know, I want to swap Litecoin for Bitcoin, that's a swap. Second is a layer two collateral. So uh, when, when I talk about layer two, that means the whatever is off-chain from the main uh, blockchain. So think of uh, Plasma, think of um, Lightning Network, something that doesn't do its operations on the main chain that, uh, that it has to uh, at some point set. So next thing is the contingent operation. So let's say there are um, exchanges that need to you know, price something in some you know, other, um, some other exchanges are pricing it in, say Bitcoin price or some uh, wrapped, uh, uh, wrapped ether or something like that, then you need to have like an Oracle connection and get the data from some other exchange. So <clears throat> contingent operations you know, generally require it. Loosely coupled oracles. So, what that means is, let's say you do want to just have a system that's entirely composed of uh, pricing in something else. So, you can have, say, wrapped Bitcoin or whatever. 
then in that case, you kind of have to rely on some other external source of data to tell you what the price of Bitcoin is if you have some operations that require it. Um, and I'll cover that in a little bit when I talk about Rainbow Network. So there are some building blocks, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very simple with this, and then we will build on top of it. So there are two more blockchains. There are aggregated network that handles sort of like, you know, rules and normalizes the protocol so that all the messages being shoved in from one blockchain are translated <coughs> and then sent over to some other network, right? Secondly, you want to have a mechanism to, you know, have a collateral because if you're talking about working with multiple blockchains, you want the you want the monetar monetary value in one chain to be immobilized while you're handling some other operation to be handed over to some other blockchain. Or maybe they both need to be immobilized at the same time. So if that's the case, then <clears throat> you need to have some mechanism that is very robust so that there's no way that your money is locked away indefinitely. So that's what, what's called hostage taking. So finally, you need some sort of clearance mechanism to, okay, once the once everything is settled and once everything is good to go, now execute the very last order and then you you know swap or whatever, right? Okay. And there are some very specific interchain, specific problems being solved. Um, say you want to do like a you know a prediction market or something like that and that relies on some of the market state or whatever. And uh, it, if you want to do anything between multiple um, and distinct blockchains, you may have to have validator inside a sort of an aggregator network that confirms sort of these states and all this, all this, you know, things are being uh, handled properly. Well, of course, like, even if you have just uh, your own blockchain, you still need some sort of validator and, uh, you know, miners confirming the, that the, the transactions are correct, those are validators. So when we talk about aggregated network <coughs> and protocol, you might not even need an aggregated network. So what am I talking about? Um, you basically, if you have an interpreter, think of it like I'm a translator, and you go to a foreign land, and we both need to talk, so you have somebody in the middle. So that's basically what an aggregated network might be. I'm using a term very loosely. So in a technical uh, language in the blockchain space, they might not use the aggregator uh, as a term, but you know, please bear with me, and if you have a better terminology, just you know, yell at me afterwards. Um, so now, the depending on how you want to uh, work with multiple chains, you may have to have the aggregate net, aggregator network rebroadcast the events that it adheres from some other blockchain. So maybe the idea is you want to listen to <coughs> uh, blocks being constructed and block rewards being made in one, and then you want to use that to purchase or sell or um, uh, transfer money on another blockchain or something like that. I mean, that's a very convoluted scenario. But in order to do that, you may have to have some sort of message bus where you have a um, messages coming in from different blockchains. And then you have to have some sort of aggregate network that handles and have the same common language within the network. So think Cosmos. That's one example. Uh, I'll cover Cosmos in a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up. I don't own any of these. I don't own Cosmos. I don't. I don't own any of those. I don't own Polkadot. Nothing. So, um, just a uh, uh, heads up. So now, when you're talking about collateralization and things are moving and things are not locked away, then you have to deal with asynchrony because block times are different. Uh, their their um, finality rules are different across different chains. So Bitcoin is not uh, known for its finality. Things are statistically reasonable at some point in the future, but it's not finality. Is <clears throat> the block that is accepted by a majority of people, it's still, you know, there are some very small chance that it might not be valid in the future. So, so where I was going with that is, if you have that sort of difference in rules, then you have possibly a different um, conditions under which things get settled, and therefore you have a race condition. So going back to collateral, so if I want to think of it like this, when you go buy a car or home, you have to, <clears throat> you 
you have to sit down with someone else and say, okay, I, I want to take a, a loan for this car, or I want to take a loan for this home, and then you sit down with other people, and at some point, you have, to, you have a very uncomfortable moment where <laughs> you're sitting down with your lawyer, and you're like, okay, here's my check, and here, where is my deed? <laughs> so we're title, right? Like, so there's a very uncomfortable moment where you have to kind of have a collateralized trade. And blockchain, in any case, is very similar. So at, you know, when you have an aggregator network that has a different economic incentive model, you have to take that into consideration. So, and you also have to understand uh, the collateralization probably is one of the ways you can prevent um, network spam. Uh, for across you know, when you're working with different uh, chains, and paying for complex computation is another. So, like say, <clears throat> well, the preventing network spam is uh, important. But if you want to make sure that, like for example, think think e Ethereum. That's a really simple case, right? You're putting up a gas, uh, which is essentially a collateral. Uh, so, if you just look at it in the context confines of Ethereum, you're putting up a collateral so that uh, when the program runs, uh, you know it, it either pays for everything, or it doesn't, or it goes and it does an infinite loop, and you just lose lose everything, right? So there's a there's a penalty for penalty which is paid for by collateral. So that's sort of the uh, paying for complex computation, and <clears throat> so this one is a little bit trickier. So. What this means, uh, collateralization is necessary if network has no rollback or continuous integration plan. And I think all that means is <clears throat> if you have some you know, uh, unforeseen consequence of your network or unforeseen consequence of a rule of a blockchain because you know, either things are on the fly, things are continuing to be developed or rules change or you know, something like that or something, you know, some, some uh, code, uh, coding errors or whatever then because you can't account for all of that, you might need to have a penalty mechanism. And that's what Lightning Network does. It has a collateral and penalty. And it's possible that you, as a node, might lose everything. That hasn't happened yet, and it's a very robust network, but it's possible. So you make, time, you make room for it. Similarly for, um, and finally, collateralization is necessary if you want it to be a network segment layer because you need something that is neutral, and that's not you, and that's not them that you know holds the money in between. Excuse me. Yeah. Good cool question. Good yeah. Question. Of course. Uh, so can you help me understand a network spam? What do you mean by that? Network spam. Yeah. So let's say that you want someone to be a uh, valid player in the network. Then they might ask you, okay, well, uh, I, I need you to put in like ten Bitcoin into the network. So that you know, then you can start, you can start uh, sending out trans transactions or whatever. I don't know if that's the case right now, but that might be a rule in the, in the aggregator network. So that's one way to have a uh, reduced uh, sock puppet, you know, uh, kind of uh, attack. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so what's hostage taking? So when when you say collateral and someone has your money. Someone else can also take hostage of your money, so that's what this is. And um, basically, it's very self-explanatory, locked away even though operations been done. And it could be a number of reasons why that's the case. It could be race condition, it could be just someone just not testing all the edge, edge cases when they're writing smart contracts. Or just uh, you thought you were you know, executing uh, a one transaction, uh, under one smart contract uh, condition, but then there was something that you didn't take into account. Like for example, someone there was a path in the smart contract program that you didn't take into account for. So that's a very likely case. And when that happens, it might be inadvertent, it might be intended, but whatever the result is, the result might be that your money is totally locked away. And it does happen fairly frequently. Uh, there are tools to discover whether that's the case too. Um, now, if it's just on single uh, chain, so when you when you collateralize something, you're creating a um, you're sending money to some like uh, uh, some neutral at some contract address or something like that that has some rules that are dependent on somewhere else. So when you have that, then um, you have to understand <laughs> what you're sending money to, um, and that's very important. Now the 
And finally, if you have any step that requires manual inter interaction, so which is sort of like what I'll cover in the uh, hash time log contract uh, scenario, it's it's possible that you might you might lose money. So I, I just want to talk a bit about centralization. So centralized exchange, if you really think about it, is just a bridge between multiple chains. It really is because when you go and you put in Bitcoin or whatever, and you want to trade it for Ether, they're just handling all the the they're they're just acting as intermediary, right? So they have the uh, databases that handle user account, uh, who has what, and so on and so forth. So if you really think about it, it's just that's basically what they are. But now, what that means is they also act as a single point of failure. So if you have a central authority that tells who owns what, you know, it can be hacked, it can be uh, taken over, uh, and you know, God knows, right? So. Jumping a little bit, yes. In this slide, mm -hmm. the whole reason why Bitcoin came into existence is to overcome this centralized. Correct. Right? Yep. Yep. So what's the point of putting this centralization in there? Great question. Great answer. Great question, and I have an answer for you. So whenever you have something that is an asset and someone wants to buy, you have to have a link back to the physical economy, right? So in Bitcoin's case. It has to be US dollar. So if someone wants to buy Bitcoin and someone wants to sell Bitcoin, you have to have some sort of exchange. Um, unfortunately, people didn't start with a decentralized exchange. If they did, it would, we would be in a very different world. Um, because they started with something like Mt. Gox or some you know, um, OTC desk, uh, you know, that's essentially the reason why you need some sort of centralization. Uh, so the decentralized way might be I come to you at, and meet at the uh, you know, coffee shop and I say, okay, uh, here is $10, can you send me Bitcoin, right? So that's like peer to peer and that's going back to the roots. Um, but because, you know, if you are in New York and I'm in San Francisco, it's a little bit different. So then you need a, the degree of centralization that's necessary for handling money. Uh, someone needs to have an escrow of your money and then all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, I think, what some most people don't ask that question frequently enough. And I think everybody should ask that: Why do we have all these intermediaries when we can, you know, build around it? Fantastic question. So, oracles are. Uh, it's not a not giant company <laughs> over there. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very poorly chosen, and I should have uh, lower taste it. So, or, so because blockchains are these isolated pockets of information that have their own rules and their own uh, informations, what you want is, let's say I want to get a temperature in San Francisco at, for some sort of like betting market, right? Like a uh, prediction market. Then it, the consequence of a settlement for that prediction market has to rely on some source of information outside of Ethereum, um, which means that smart contract has to make a call out into the outside world. Um, that seems like an easy problem to solve, but actually it, there's a lot of problems that can happen just in the same way that if you go to a public Wi-Fi, um, there might be a lot of problems. So oracles provide an external information, but, uh, and they might be useful for some smart contracts. And uh, there are some um, cross-chain operations that might just use the very loosely coupled oracles to kind of act as a uh, in the way to bridge the gap. So like for an example, um, instead of requiring Bitcoin immediately, you might say, okay, why don't I create a synthetic pair for Bitcoin using Ethereum and then you know, have a token inside the Ethereum network so that it represents what Bitcoin is. So like you put up money in Ether, but it's like priced in Bitcoin. So you, you have you know, wrapped Bitcoin essentially, but that might not even require a uh, collateralized Bitcoin. Um, now, when you start doing that, when you start making call out from you know, Ethereum to everywhere else, so what happens in Ethereum? You have a miner that's basically a general computing platform and it runs a EVM bytecode, right? So when you run an EVM bytecode, which is a, the, 
Think of it like an assembly code. So you have a Solidity, which is a high a high level language, and it uh, compiles down to EVM bytecode. And the miners have to run these EVM bytecode in their computers, essentially. And when these computers run these instructions, um, some of them may have to just make an HTTP request out. So which means that if you're a miner and you uh, are smart enough, you can do a lot of damage. So for an example, you can make a call out to, uh, let's say I have a smart contract that says, make a call to uh, wolframalpha.com, right? But instead of calling to wolframalpha.com, miner who is, has their own DNS rebinding might call out to their own service, but call to wolframalpha.com and give me falsified info. So it's, it's very important that you design your system around these kind of you know, traditional attacks, which it's just a DNS rebinding issue, right? Like, so you just have to think about, in the context of the, the code execution, how does it reach out to the internet? Um, so there's also, like, miners can cherry pick transactions, so they can look at very specific patterns and then only run those uh, transactions and construct blocks from that. Um, finally, Authenticity is a very different problem than validity. You guys are all um, uh, software professionals, so you know. Um, if I just told you, yeah, um, something is authentically you know, reached out from, you know, I got it from Sonoma Valley, uh, this uh, wine, right? Uh, yeah, I got it from Sonoma Valley, that's authentic. But that doesn't mean that it's actually wine inside the bottle. So validity is a very different problem than authenticity. So even if you reach out to the right source, you know, the temperature that they told you might not be exactly correct. So that's something to kind of keep in mind when you're working with an Oracle. Um, there are different solutions out there. So one of them is Oracleize. So Oracleize uh, solves the authenticity issue. Uh, and then there's Chainlink, which solves the beta data validity issue. So you have, you know, kind of you pull multiple sources and say, okay, temperature at San Francisco, what are they? And three different sources tell you and uh, through Chainlink. Um, now, cross-chain settlement. So now we're talking big. Yes? Yeah, a question about all of this. My first time. Oh, no, no worries. I know this is a term. So for, for every specific chain, mm -hmm. uh, there's only one Oracle for this chain? Oh, no, no. Or no, no. limited? No, no. So or Oracle is just a class classification. Whenever you reach out to somewhere else from, you get information from outside of the blockchain, then that's called an Oracle. That's it. It's just a very fancy way of saying you're just reaching outside from the blockchain. So since I'm building a blockchain uh, mm -hmm. prototype, mm -hmm. I have a client. Yeah. This client is just a feed there to the chain. Uh -huh. So this client is an Oracle. Right? Um, so a point of um, a clarification might be uh, if, you, if you have a, something that modifies the uh, contract from outside because it has a right access to, that's not quite an Oracle. Uh, if, if the contract reaches out to some web service or whatever, then that is an Oracle. That web service is construed as an Oracle. So if you like say, if you have something that changes the contract itself, then that's just you having access, right permission to that contract address. Oh, I see. Yeah, so that, that's a little different than Oracle. So it's like, you know, it's like talking to somebody versus, you know, writing a, a, a diary. <laughs> So this is only applies for the Ethereum network? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are oracles in different blockchains. Um, I'm not very familiar with EOS or you know, Cardano or stuff like that, but I'm sure they have primitives yeah. that allow you to do that. Yeah. So kind of a yeah. internal server, this uh, oracle is actually the uh, smart contract. If they can just call out of the server to grab information, mm -hmm. that server will be the oracle. That's right. The, the server that you reach out to from the smart contract is called or oracle or the any information source. Um, so the cross-chain settlement is like the you know, easiest thing you can think about when you deal with multiple, you know, working with multiple blockchains. So a, a pragmatic way might be to have a collateral that, you know, you, you collateralize and lock everything, and then you say, okay, based on some rule, now do a swap. So that's one way to do it. The, but the, the, so there's different ways to do it. So one is, the pre-commitment model where you send out a bunch of conditional transactions into the blockchain. You, you just say, you know, this transaction will execute if you meet these conditions. So you just send them out, uh, and but it's not spent yet, quote unquote. 
which means that uh, the, the transfer of Bitcoin from one address to another that didn't happen yet. So that, which means that all of these like pre-committed uh, transactions are ready to be run as soon as like someone's willing to you know spend it. Now the escrow model is basically it's actually a lot simpler. Escrow model is a lot simpler because what you're saying is you just send money to some address and then there's some program running on it and then it goes spits it back out to you. Okay, it's not clear to me on the collateral. Uh -huh. How the collateral is mutually accepted by the two different blockchain operating with two different set of rules to two different entities, two right. different currencies, right, right, right. different of everything. Right. How do they agree on the collateral? So that's perfect. So now, um, and I'll go to that more in detail when I talk about hash time on contracts, but that is the summary of all the, the entire talk, right? Hold on, I'll wait. So yeah, oh, no, no. <laughs> so so the long, long, long story short, basically if the uh, two different blockchains share similar, you know, similar primitives or similar opcode or similar uh, hashing algorithm, then it is possible to have a, um, you know, atomic swap based on a collateralization. Um, but it's uh, it's not always the case. For example, Ethereum and you know Bitcoin has vastly different models. Um, now, oh, so are you saying that this problem? Cannot be solved for a universal across different blockchains, but only in a subset. Correct. So, okay, got it. Correct, and therefore you need a um, sort of a uh, engineering solution might be to have a interoperability chain in the middle, uh -huh. or have centralized service or something like that. Yeah. Um, but there is a way to do it if the chains exhibit similar characteristics. So. Multi-party settlement is very complicated. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. I, sometimes I, I get confused on that as well. Uh, the immediate intermediate chain could be used, like we discussed. And so we're going to talk about hash time lock contract. And I don't know whether this uh, this uh, dash should be there, but anyways. Um, so hash time lock contract. What what is it? Uh, so it's it's a combination of time lock and hash lock. And so hash lock is something that unlocks if you have a, um, you know, if you un if you know the secret to which the hash uh, gets generated, uh, and time lock is it just expires like say forty eight hours or twenty four hours. So it's a combination of those two uh, that creates a very clever mechanism for um, atomic swap. And so I kind of covered a lot of it. Uh, now it's also refundable, which means. If one party didn't, you know, uh, meet their obligation, then you, you could probably get your money out. So that's a really good thing. And lastly, it's a pre-commitment model, which means you uh, stage the transaction. So you, you public, public, publicly let everybody know this uh, transaction executes if you meet some condition. And uh, I, I don't expect you to read all this and understand, so I'm going to just this is even worse, right? So <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through it really quickly. Um, so think of it like this. Think of it like, say, Alice and Bob wants to trade, and Alice has Bitcoin and Bob has Litecoin. So they're very similar, um, similar blockchains, and they use same, a similar hashing algorithm. And therefore, you can do one of the following. So Alice says, OK, look, I'm going to create a transaction that you, Bob, can use to get money out, and that's uh, Transaction uh, one, and that what that is is, if you have a uh, if you have the secret password, then you can get the money out from that transaction. So that's one. Secondly, Bob says the same thing except on Litecoin side. Basically, it says, okay, if uh, if you have the if you Alice has a secret, then you can get my money out. So you'll say like what you're <laughs> you're just giving her the money because she she has she's the only one with the secret. Well, I'll get to that. Um, it's an interesting model, but what you what what I didn't write and I should have is that the when you when Alice uh, you, uh, takes the money out of this transaction, she has to broadcast to everybody what that secret is. So so which means that okay, here's a secret that you know you Bob can use to execute this transaction now. So, which means that there's no requirement for Alice to tell Bob directly, and there, you know, therefore it's it's automatic. So it's not automatic, but it's a it's a um, 
it doesn't require, it, there is no hostage taking. Alice can't just like withhold the secret uh, in order to prevent Bob from taking money out. But she didn't reprogram the secret, uh, assuming she was fast enough. That's right, and that's why you pre-commit the uh, transactions. So therefore, the, the hash... Um, Which is soft commit, if that's what pre-commit? Um, so when you what you do is you broadcast a transaction okay. that has all these parameters already built into it at the same time, and what that means is um, she has to she can change the secret after broadcasting these transactions um, because it's now written into the blockchain. So now the the these um, uh, P2SH uh, or the contract addresses have this parameters already built in. Um, Bob can spend it once he has a secret. So I'll actually, I'll cover this really quickly. I'm sorry this is not very um, intuitive. Um, so what does this all mean? Mm -hmm. So I'll start with from the very beginning, and I may have to take 10 minutes to do this. So Alice creates a secret. So it might be a random number or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's just a bunch of numbers. And after that, Alice creates a two transactions. One is to uh, allow Bob to take money out uh, from Network X. Second is to um, send it back to send it back to Alice. So this is an expiration. So let's say that you know they weren't able to agree to a term. Then you know 48 hours later it goes back to back to her. Uh, Bob does the same thing. Creates a transaction motion. <laughs> uh, shoot. Um, transaction three, which uh, is for Alice to take money out, mm -hmm. say this is Litecoin, and then transaction four, which um, if it expires, Bob gets his money back. Now, the important part really is once you submitted these transactions to the networks, they're already there. So Alice and Bob cannot change the terms of this atomic swap. So that's already baked into the system. And after that, uh, what happens is now uh, three, four, and then five, the, uh, now I'm having trouble. All right, so Bob signs the transaction two, and then sends it to Alice and says, okay, now you can start, start the process of executing these transactions. Because Alice already sent out a TX2 saying, you know, you can use this to start the swap. So Bob signs it, sends it back to Alice, and then Alice then says, okay, now I can use the result of uh, uh, TX2 to get the money out from the network Y, which is this. So using her own key, she can now spend that money. So after that, Bob, because Bob will see the secret that's in the network Y, because it's part of a transaction uh, script. So if you're talking about Bitcoin script, it's all plain text. So the secret is already plain, plainly written into the into the transaction. So Bob can read the secret and then using that uh, get the money out of network X, which in our case would be Bitcoin. So now they did uh, cross chain swap. And if you're having trouble understanding this because it's the first time, same. Uh, for me, it took me a very long time to go through this. Yes? Um, why are transaction one and three not time uh, expired? Oh, uh, yes, they are. Uh, so in fact, uh, so, so the transaction one is pay point X to Bob's public address if Bob knows the release secret. And then transaction two is paying coin X from transaction one back to Alice's public address and it expires in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then the same on the other side, except Bob's expiration is 40, 24 and not 48 hours. Um, so, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe, maybe you yeah. would be done with it? Yes. So what you depicted in this diagram uh -huh. is, is sort of the kind of peer-to-peer -peer decentralized model of, a, of an exchange, is that correct? Correct, yeah, is that correct? that's absolutely right. This is atomic swap as described by Thierry Nolan, which is an online persona, and Mike Fern. Um, Mike Fern is a very um, well-respected figure in the cryptocurrency world, and Thierry Nolan, uh, if you go to Bitcoin, um, forum uh, kind of describe this process of atomic swap between the similar 
similarly uh, ruled uh, blockchain. So yes, this is, but so, yeah, absolutely. But, okay. but the problem with this is that all this requires in intervention, right? You need to you need to listen to the network activity on Y and then transmit the transaction correctly on X. It's very confusing. I'd be happy to kind of go through the flow uh, after the fact, uh, after the session, and uh, kind of walk you through it, walk you through it one by one by one. Um, I'm so sorry that I can't make this any easier. Um, but the I but the basic idea behind it is that you pre-commit the transactions that you can back out of. Mm -hmm. So the rules are already there, and so one so one condition has a timeout so that you get your money back if no one executes it. And the second condition is you once you once one party spends the transaction using the secret, then the other party knows the secret just by virtue of that secret being released into the wild. So that's the that's the basic concept of it. The the coordination part is very important too. So like say Alice wants to, you know, spend at the 23rd hour and 59 minutes, that's actually against her own uh, better judgment because if she does that, then she, she could actually lose out on the whole deal. <laughs> so she might be out of the coin. So it's just, uh, it's a very elegant way to do it, but it also requires a very focused mindset to kind of come up with something like this. And there are different ways to do atomic swaps as well. Uh, and again, if, you, if everything is internal to the same chain, then escrow model is just fine because then you can just write a smart contract rule that does it. So uh, Blockstream, which is a big name in the Bitcoin world, uh, came up uh, with a concept called sidechain. So what, what it is is a federated, um, federated chain that has a similar rule set as the main chain. So like say Liquid Network, which is a block, uh, Blockstream's own uh, sidechain has a very similar rule set as a Bitcoin main chain, but it also has extra you know, operations and uh, things of that nature. Now, what's the benefit of that? Benefit to that is that the participants in the network gets to determine how quickly things get resolved. So if you're a part of this federated network, then you know what? Maybe you're an exchange. Maybe you have a lot of uh, money at stake and you want to use a side chain to send money faster or something to that effect. So it does come in handy. Now, what that means is you still have to have a collateral. Um, and it's, if you don't understand the mechanism of the side chain very well, then you might not want to participate in it. So make sure that if you are, then just read up on the rules. Uh, if you're building anything, read up on the rules for the side chain that you're participating in. Um, now, the so depending on how compatible the side chain is to the main chain, you might be able to also do merge mining. So if you do merge mining, then you're, you're getting money from two, two different chains. So that might be profitable for you as a miner, but if you are also worried about bootstrapping the security guarantee on the side chain, then yeah, uh, making it compatible so that the miners would participate in your side chain mining, uh, that immediately increases your hashing power, right? which means that you're getting all this for free. Uh, well, not free, but you get the idea. Um, so you can bootstrap your hash power very quickly by making it you know, uh, amenable for that. So there's a bunch of different examples. Liquid is one, uh, Rootstock is another. So um, drive chain is a very interesting idea uh, because it kind of uh, makes people think about, okay, how do we, take this sidechain idea and expand it you know, in a different uh, spectrum. So it's a meta protocol on main chain. What, whatever, what, is, what does that mean? So I, I'm not an expert on drive chain, so I'm sure people online will you know, yell at me, and I hope they do so I can learn more about it. Um, but basically what it means is the, the sidechain doesn't rely strictly on what the main chain do, does except when the settlement occurs. So what that means is, you know, in drive chain terminology, you want to take, instead of like a party to party, you know, two party uh, escrow, like for example, what we saw in uh, hash time lock contracts, drive chain has a escrow that is designated for the entire side chain participants. 
So what that means is it opens up a possibility for a uh, settlement that is kind of uh, crossing the boundary. So let me give you an example. So in the HTLC, you can only trade with people you already know because you have to create that bi-directional relationship. But in drive chain, you could create a, um, a, a participant pool or something like that, or escrow, I don't know the exact term, that allows the participants to, when you settle with some arbitrary party in the future, the participant in the, the, the drive chain could take that money out because they have the, the secret to be able to take that money out. So it's a, it's a very interesting idea, but it requires an additional coordination. So what that means is the drive chain every 90 something days uh, takes a snapshot of Bitcoin and say, okay, well, you know, now I need to look at what happened on the drive chain versus what happened on Bitcoin network and then kind of reconcile the difference. So there is some uh, snapshotting that's required. Now, which means that you might also need the soft port and miners might need to participate. But you know, if, the, if there's a lot of value, you know, value that it brings, maybe that's worthwhile looking into. I don't know. So Rainbow Network is something that Dan Robinson came up with. He's, um, he's a very smart fella, uh, and so a lot smarter than I am. Um, but the basic idea is you might not even have to have a interoperability layer if it's mainly for payment that requires some, some kind of collateral, collateralization. You might just have to uh, rely on oracles. So say, like, if you have reliable oracles out there, say like an exchange, uh, multiple exchanges that tell you what the prices are, then what you could do is create, in his words, synthetic pair uh, or synthetic um, instrument. So what that means is you create a uh, tokenized form of Bitcoin inside Ether, the Ethereum network that is uh, uh, that is collateralized by the price or you have to collateralize it to meet the price obligation. So like you can put in Ether to this, uh, you know, some sort of contract that is priced in Bitcoin. That way, you know, if the price of Bitcoin goes up against Ether, then you have to put in more Ether to make sure that your obligations are met or something to that effect. Um, so, which means you have, you know, the, you have loose coupling, and when you have loose coupling, then that allows you to kind of um, uh, run things without having direct uh, interface between the uh, different blockchains. So, synthetic pairs are, pairs are interesting, but it, again, the, the fault of that is it relies on, relies heavily on oracles, um, which means that, you know, you might not be able to do certain things that you want, and also if you want to do have a like price setting behavior, relying on oracles to have a synthetic instrument pricing is not really going back to the demand and supply side of things, right? So if you're trading in you know exchanges, then there's actually demand and supply that settles the spot requirement, but if you have a synthetic um, obligation then it's relying on the price only and not the actual demand and supply. So which is, eh, I don't know, I'm not an economist, so I can't really tell you how uh, important that is, but I think it's kind of important. So Cosmos is an interesting way to kind of try to have a hub of uh, activity. So you have kind of hub and spokes model where you have Cosmos acting as an inter intermediary for multiple chains, and you have to have a um, common um, consensus mechanism within the participants in the Cosmos network um, so that you know the, you, you minimize the problem that could arise with things like uh, different consensus rules creating different asynchrony and different finality rules creating different problems. So you want to have a single rule set uh, in the uh, up chain, there you go, <laughs> and then uh, which runs a this a um, very um, interesting consensus mechanism called Tendermint. I, you know, you're gonna have to read the, the actual paper. Unfortunately, I, I, I have hard time explaining the HTLC, so it's gonna be a lot more difficult to go through Tendermint. Um, but what that means is the participant zone, zones with, like, say, it could be Bitcoin, it could be uh, Cardano, or whatever, or EOS, or whatever. Um, could use their own consensus mechanism, but they do have to have a bridging mechanism that uses Tendermint. So they need some something that 
goes from their you know, uh, mechanism to tenderment, and which means pegging zones. Now, uh, it says Q&A, so <laughs> we are Q&A. What would be a perfect scenario where a smart, smart contract can be better than traditional ways? Um, it, it really depends. I mean, so smart contracts are just, you know, a program running on internet, right? So, which means that traditional ways of, 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 of transacting could be anything like, if you're talking about payment network, you know, it's a proprietary protocol in some, you know, Visa or something like that. But if you have multiple participants that might not want to pay to, you know, play, maybe a um, public blockchain with its own smart contract is a sufficiently good solution. Then you can have a, uh, you can have a very common network that is programmable and has similar features. There's just to it to this, like in financial services world, the, the, the area of trade finance, where um, at least six, six parties are involved. Um, and it's the, the buyer, the, the seller, uh, the seller bank, bank the buyer bank, uh, the, the tax authority, the, the shipping authority, all of those parties, like especially international trade finance. Mm -hmm. Letter of credits come from one bank to another bank. It's a very complex process, mostly manual. You know, blockchain or several blockchains because you have several banks maybe running different blockchain. That that's a classic solution for this problem because today it's just a mess. It's it's all yeah. manual and it's a bunch of documents, faxes, whatever going back and forth. So this this is a low hanging fruit. Right. Are people doing? Uh, are People are doing, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, again, I mean, how how much of this is theory and how much is actually in in the operation uh, by the banks? I mean, the banks are notoriously kind of conservative bodies because they have to comply, right? There's regulations. So, but a lot of banks have experimented with, uh, have been experimenting with blockchain, and then the bridging of different blockchains because, of course, you know, bank in country A. And the banking country B will not run the same blockchain. Right, right. So I mean, so the, the going back to your answer now, you know, smart contract is native to one blockchain. So which means that if it solves in one blockchain, then that might be sufficient. So in the context of uh, using it across different blockchains, the if you have a uh, settlement that requires same rules in two different blockchains, then you will probably have to write two different smart contracts in two different blockchains that have same rules. So, so which means that you have to understand multiple, um, multiple programming uh, languages in different blockchains. Uh, for, for an example, RSK uh, Rootstock actually tries to make it easy by using Solidity, which is the same language that uh, Ethereum uses. Um, but more fundamentally, going into your question, yeah, smart contract is a great way if you need a neutral ground um, to use blockchain as a, a place for settling and place for reporting data. Um, and one example might be real estate uh, or titles for cars or something like that. So imagine Carfax, you know, just dumping all that data into uh, you know Ethereum or something. I don't know. Uh, that's not my business. So I, I really don't know. Uh, hope that helps. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So on the same example of six parties involved in yep. a transaction uh -huh. and banks being conservative because of regulation, mm -hmm. how much of regulations have caught up to blockchain and oh. cryptocurrency? Oh boy. Um, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, um, that's a, so you're, you're, you're two for two on excellent questions. Um, now, I think that the regulators in general, so there is a blockchain caucus in Washington, D.C. Uh, regulators in general are more concerned with financial aspect of the blockchain much so than the uh, sort of like the uh, code as law aspect of blockchain, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of room for growth in code as law uh, or you, you know computational law aspect of it. So there, there's a, there isn't a lot of focus in that, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, but there is some um, uh, regulators who are very uh, uh, savvy about this and they, uh, they people across different states have started to say okay fine if you incorporate you can actually publish your um, you know uh, corporate documents in blockchain and we'll accept it as such and you know now it's a legal document that 
is everywhere. So, which makes sense because you know if you have your own private key and if you sign the document using um, your private key and you, you, know, you, you push it out to public blockchain, then that's just as well as having a, um, you know, uh, some uh, uh, notary verify who you are. But of course there is downside to it, which is, yeah, it only verifies that you have your key. It doesn't mean that you were that person. So there's a lot of uh, linkage to real world that still hasn't quite cut off. And uh, I can foresee that being a big business in the future. So the identity part is big. Uh, reputation part is another part. And the, the computational law part is the third part. Um, so like in the, in the cryptocurrency world and blockchain world, uh, law is, law, law is uh, sorry, code is law has a very different context than say code is law in the you know, rest of the world. So in, in the blockchain world, you, you want to be overly restrictive so that there is no other ways to game the system. So when someone says code is law, it's literally law. There's nothing else you can do. But in real law, that's not the case. The law is very interpretive and it's based on sort of thousands of years of jurisprudence, which is you know, very difficult. Yeah. I have to ask you this question. Sure. Facebook, uh, Libra. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, if you sort of, if you or your company, you guys experiment with uh, oh, chaining uh, Libra to, let's say, Ethereum, and I know it's it's very different paradigm there. Yeah. Different language, different. Sure. But some of the concepts are similar. So yeah. Have you experimented with Libra? Um. So Libra is very interesting because technically it's it's uh, very well done. Um, so the interfacing with it and tooling around it is very awkward, but if you go through the technical white paper, it's generally pretty solid. Um, the problem, of course, is, well, and even before we're talking about problems, Libra has a very different model of finality, meaning that it doesn't collect, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't collect transactions in a block and then tries to solve for it. It's basically every transaction that goes out the door uh, gets verified by verifiers, so you know the, the industry partners. So which means there's a transaction level finality, uh, which means that yeah, you know, there's no rollback. I mean, or you can have a rollback because of finality. Um, so it, it is pretty solid tech, uh, although politics uh, being what they are, I, I I doubt that they are. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know anything. Have you crossed uh, cross chain um, Libra to let's say interpret tried that? Or oh, geez. Do anything? Um, I uh, unfortunately have not had a, uh, the, had too much time to play with it. I only looked at it from one angle, but not interacting with the nice. cross chain aspect of it. Yes. A follow up on this Libra topic. Mm -hmm. So I actually heard the, the Congress hearing about uh, Libra uh -huh. a few days ago. And it, my the sense I'm getting is that the, the regulators don't want any anything to undermine dollar, I, the fiat currency. Yeah, I, I mean, so as whether it be liberal or any cryptocurrency, sure. they just don't they just don't want anything to. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, well, as as a as a founder of a startup, I would hope that Congress uh, men and Congress women look into this. Um, blockchain industry with a sober eye and you know hear what the entrepreneurs have to say um, and not get too hung up on sort of whether it's a challenge to the sovereignty of the country or not. Um, in, in Libra's case it's very difficult because Facebook is so big but if I'm just creating smart contract that you know has a you know a programmable flower uh, that exists on Ethereum. I, I sure hope that I don't get penalized by U.S. Congress. Um, you know, it, it has to do with the, the scope of things. I think if the if the impact is small, then maybe you know regulators should be more lenient. Right. But but I, I again I have no position on this. Right. If you if you use blockchain for smart contract, then they are okay with it. But yeah. my point is that yeah. any currency that can challenge dollar will eventually be. Facing the regulatory resistance. Oh, uh, sure. If they, if they have the sure, sure, it. sure. I so, mean, but but going back to oh, no, no, it's it's absolutely necessary to try, and because of the following reason. So if you go back to before there was a central bank, you had regional private banks issuing notes, 
And the reason why the you know, there was a centralization is you know there were there, there, there was a, a lot of people were afraid that they would be um, it's like it's like using common metric system right across the board, meaning that if you have dollars issued by one bank, it might not be uh, redeemable in the next day. But I don't know if that's true. I'm not an economist. Uh, maybe the private banking is better than you know a central banking. Who knows? I really am not the, the suited for this. I only know how to program things. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not giving you a very satisfactory answer. I'm just going to add to that. Right? I mean, the reason big governments are, governments are interested in this, you know, is because they're looking at taxation, right? It's a big source of revenue, right? Right, and they can control that through fiat yeah. currencies. Very oh, I, I do have something to say for that, yeah. and and it has to do with um, there's a there's a county in New York called Berkshire, not to be confused, Berkshire Hathaway, that issued their own um, local currency called uh, Berkshires. And it's a uh, one-to-one -one redeemable to US dollar. And in fact, there's nothing in US uh, rules or laws that prevent you from having a local currency, as long as it's taxable. So make it taxable, make it all legal, and you're, you're cold. Um, so. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you, and you know, just uh, please let me know. Thanks, Jay. It was great. Um, and um, if you want to talk to Jay, we've got like half an hour of networking. So if you want to ask him more questions, um, also I wanted to tell you that we have a, an event on the sixth of November in Shepherd Mullen, Palo Alto called State of, of Tokens, and as you know, and I noticed the people are discussing this, uh, there has been quite a few um, hits from the SEC um, to um, STOs, um, so we're actually going, to, we've got quite a few big names for that event. If you want to come along to that, um, you'll find it on our website, or um, you'll receive a newsletter with the links to this video, and uh, there'll be a link to that. Thank you very much for coming. Um, you do want to do the raffle? Yes. So now the big raffle with the tablet is going to be happening. Are you going to hold this one? Of course, yeah. Okay, so the winning ticket is 9782. Wow. Who's the lucky person? Yeah, Whoa! Good, right. <laughs> Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Aaron.